I'd like you to get something to write with, something because there's something that's really just a uh, burden on my heart that I want to share with you today. Let's, let's let the Lord speak to us. This has um, resonated with me in such a strong way. One of the old Puritans said it like this. Sin is so powerful that it made the devil the devil. Think of that for just a moment. Sin, Satan didn't create sin. Sin existed before even Satan existed. Sin is so powerful that it made the devil the devil. Because that's true, folks, we, we need the church to speak and preach against sin. We have to do that. We cannot become casual on, this, on the topic of sin. Somebody put it like this, casual Christians become casualties. Let me say that again. Casual Christians will eventually become casualties. Something caught my attention in the Gospel of John this week that is not in, let me explain it like this. We call this in in. in in theology and study of the Bible, we call this the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What makes Matthew, Mark, and Luke different than the gospel of John is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics because they present similar narratives, almost the same stories of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But John, the gospel of John is not called a synoptic. It's in a class all by itself. While the synoptics open up with the birth and the genealogy of Jesus, John begins to open up in a brand new way. This is one of the most unique gospels because it doesn't start out like the other three gospels. John takes us to the beginning, or let me put it this way. It takes us to the real beginning. Listen to what he says. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. I want you to understand how important this is. And the word was God. Think about this for just a moment. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That sounds very much like Genesis 1-1 that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But here's what this verse tells us in the book of John. Listen to this. This book tells us that the in the beginning of John takes place before the the in the beginning of Genesis. Let me just say that again. The in the beginning of John takes place even before Genesis 1-1. That puts Jesus, hold on now, puts Jesus in this whole unique category, which means this. Jesus is the only person who ever lived before he was born. That's Jesus. Think of that for just a moment. Some of you are going like, it's too early, Pastor Tim, to go through all this. Put that back up on the screen for a second because some of you just need to get this. It's early for some of you because you thought you'd be sleeping. Jesus is the only person who ever lived before he was even born. That's what John begins to show us in this unique gospel. But there is another striking thing that caught my attention that John does that no other gospel does. As the other gospels speak about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, And then this most important part, the cleansing of the temple. The cleansing of the temple was Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, comes into the temple, and the Bible tells us that they have taken prayer out of God's house and set up tables to make make money in God's house. That literally prayer is removed and the ability to profit in God's house is now beginning to be the thing that is pursued. That's why it is so important. I want to just challenge you for these next nights that, that, that we're open here to pray. Starting tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll come and we're going to pray over every one of these request cards, whatever it is. I prayed before I came in and walked into the sanctuary. I prayed with a dad today that just said, pray for my son. He's facing, he, he told me, he said he told me this week after a tragedy in his life, he told me this week that he is an atheist now. And we just prayed. We prayed for that precious boy. I prayed with a grieving father in in the lobby here. I want to see that on a card. I want you to put those things out on this card so we can begin to pray over these things and and believe on tonight as we pray from 6 to 7. Then we go into a time of worship, and then we're going to begin to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll join back at 6. We'll pray over every one of these cards 
and then we'll begin at seven o'clock to sing, and then we're gonna pray for healing. If you need healing in your body, we are gonna anoint everyone with oil according to James chapter five, and we're gonna believe for God to heal people and miracles to take place. In our own family, I'm just telling you this, in the Delina family, we need miracles. We need miracles. We need healing miracles even in our own family. And then on Tuesday night, we're going to pray over every student. We're going to pray over every teacher, every professor, that in the time that they're getting ready to go back to school, we believe God is going to give you the power to stand. If you're watching online, we are going to be online for, the, for tonight and Tuesday night and Monday night and Tuesday night. And then Wednesday night will be our worldwide prayer meeting as we're believing on Wednesday night for the, for the power of deliverance, that God is going to break sin cycles in your family. Those things that have held a family, whether it be divorce or addiction, we believe God wants to break those things. Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey and then comes to the temple and cleanses it. He turns over the tables and the money changers that the Bible says and said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And then he starts his journey to the cross. But here's what I want you to get. This is what stood out to me, which makes John so unique. The cleansing of the temple happened towards the end of Jesus's life in those synoptic gospels. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The gospels, those synoptic gospels, put it at the end of Jesus's life. Then he begins to go to the cross. But then all of a sudden, this unique gospel, which stands alone, which reminds us that Jesus was the only one who lived before he was born, does something that these gospels don't do. In the gospel of John, all of a sudden, that it, the cleansing of the temple, occurs at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Where the synoptics bring it to the end and then the cross, this gospel starts it at the beginning before Jesus begins to preach a word or do anything. He comes into his own temple, cleanses it, and says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, which means that there are two temple cleansings three years apart. Now, question, why is this important? Why do you have the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus's ministry? And why do you have the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus's ministry? Okay, get ready now, Times Square Church. Get ready online. It's for this reason, because junk always tries to come back into the temple. Because sin is never stagnant. It is always looking for a way to get into the temple. That's why the very things Jesus drove out three years earlier now show back up three years later. The money changers he fought against, turned over their tables, are now set up again. Okay, here's what's sobering to me. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Think about it. First Corinthians 6, 19, it says, do you not know that your bodies are the, say it with me, temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, which tells me, church, if we don't take this sin issue seriously in the church, then we find ourselves becoming a casualty to all those things that are trying to come back into our lives. Those things that are fighting, not just to get into the church, but fighting to get into our own lives. Jesus speaks about this re-entry of something wicked that has left us and is trying, like those money changers, to fight its way back into the temple. And Jesus warns us of something so sobering when he says these words. When an impure spirit, look at this now, comes out of a person, it goes to places seeking rest and doesn't find it, then it says, I'm going to return to the house that I left. Now here it comes. When it arrives, it finds the house swept, clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first part. Think of that. Jesus is saying this about an impure spirit that the re-entry of impurity comes back seven times stronger. That when God begins to sweep through our lives, folks, it is a fight to keep the junk out. It is a fight to keep sin out of our lives. 
Folks, this is not a protection that all of a sudden when you become a pastor, you don't get attacked. We have got, I, we have to take it seriously in our marriage. We have to take it seriously in our minds and in our hearts. Why? Because junk always wants to come back. It is always trying to come back. When we pastored in Detroit, we um, connected to our church. We purchased and owned a Christian bookstore right in the center of Detroit. And um, it, was, it was the largest Christian bookstore in that area. And um, in that bookstore, we had a section. It was so lame, but it was for Christian toys. It was just, it was, we had no business having a Christian toy section, but we did. When, when I grew up, we had, we had G.I. Joes. How many remember G.I. Joes? I think we had in this uh, figurines of Moses and of David and of Jesus. And I'm going, I grew up playing with G.I. Joes and now... Um, and then they had the little section of the armor of God, and you, you, you put that on people, and then you had the veggie tails and um, all that stuff. I had a friend tell me that with their Christian bookstore, parents started returning the figurines, the dolls of Moses and Jesus and David. They started returning, and this is what they said. They said, our kids are having them beat up each other. <laughs> That's what they said. They said, Moses is beating up David, and then Moses and David are ganging up on Jesus and beating Jesus up, and they returned them to the store because they were fighting each other. Now, folks, bear with me for a second. The problem was there was no antagonist. If you have Moses, you got to have Pharaoh, and if you have David, you got to have who? Goliath. Someone said, Saul, that's pretty good. This is a biblical church. <laughs> and if you have Jesus, you have to have Satan. But here's what happens. Why did this go on? Because we were created to fight. Christians were meant to fight. And if we don't fight sin and the devil, we end up fighting each other. And if our, if our attention is not turned to the real fight that's going on, we end up fighting each other in the church. And all of a sudden, because we were created to fight, I, I, this, think about this. It's amazing how believers will try to engage you in a fight to try to take away your strength and try to deplete you of, of any, any semblance of strength that you need for the real fight. That's why, always remember this, a Christian has no right being in a fight unless it's a spiritual fight. Has no right being in a fight. If, if you're fighting with someone across this aisle, stop it. If you have a fight with me, see the elders. But let me just tell you something right now. Understand how important this is. I never want to stop fighting against the thing I'm supposed to be fighting against. The real fight is for our soul and for holiness. I want to I live like the great evangelist that got, his name was Billy Sunday, that got saved, was a, played for the Chicago White Sox. This great baseball player, Billy Sunday, was led to the Lord, left Major League Baseball back in the 1940s and 50s and started preaching the gospel. And this is the way I want to live. Listen to what Billy Sunday said. He said, listen. I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as I've got a foot. I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist, and I'll butt it as long as I've got a head, and I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. But when I'm old, fistless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum it to death until I go home to glory. That means something to us old people, because that's the fight I want to be in. That's the fight. So to, to come to a place that never talks about sin, folks, that's dangerous. Because then you're dealing with re-entry. You're dealing with those things that want to come back. This Christian life is a fight. And as I was reading about the first king of Israel that someone mentioned here, that David needed a Saul, they were absolutely right. He lost Saul, the first king of Israel, lost that spiritual fight for his soul. You know why? Because he ended up fighting the wrong person. I want you to think about it. He is a man whose sin keeps him 
coming back, this, this, this spirit, this impure spirit coming back with intensity. Because instead of Saul fighting for his soul, he was fighting David. He turns on David. He turns to fight the man that God wants to raise up. And all of a sudden, the man that God is raising up, he makes him the enemy. And instead of Saul fighting for the purity of mind and purity of soul, folks, I want to say something to you that I really felt God speak to me. Because when you see believers fighting believers, reentry in some areas happens. I'm going to tell you that. Because you cannot fight each other and then leave this unprotected and the enemy not get in here. This is where our fight is, the fight for our soul, the fight for purity. When you see believers fighting believers, watch out. Because reentry has taken place at some spot. Because you cannot begin to make this valiant fight for victory without that beginning to happen. And Saul invited back things. Listen, he invited back things because of that fight that he got rid of years earlier. He invited back things that seemed to be taken out of his temple, taken out of his eyesight, and now he is inviting those things back in. And at the end of his life, Saul's re-entry, Luke chapter 11, that passage, is best defined. I want you to write down these words. That in Saul's life, the witch is back. The witch is back in his life again. Sounds like an old bad country song, doesn't it? The witch is back. This is what happens to the life of Saul. This is what goes on. When I say the witch is back, the witch is back means you've allowed sinful things back into your life that were put out years ago. That's what happened with Saul. And in, for him, it was an actual witch that was invited, invited back into his life. Like the money changers are back in the temple three years later. The impure spirit comes back like Luke 11 that happens in believers and preachers. Here's Saul's finale and how his life ends and where the witch is back. Let me read it to you because this is just the last chapter before Saul dies. Here's his finale. It says this, Samuel was now dead. This is 1 Samuel 28. Samuel was now dead and all Israel had mourned his death and buried him in Ramah, his hometown. Saul had long since cleaned out all those, notice this verse, cleaned out all those who held seances with the dead. Now, all of a sudden, it adds this to this narrative. Verse 4, look at this. The Philistines had mustered their troops and camped at Shunem. Saul had assembled all of Israel, camped at Gilboa, but when Saul saw the Philistine troops, here it comes, he shook in his boots, scared to death. This is the fear part. This is where the fear comes in. Saul prayed to God, here it comes, folks, but God didn't answer, neither by dream nor by sign or nor by prophet. So what does Saul do? Instead of falling on his knees, Saul ordered his officials to find me someone who can call up the spirits so I can seek counsel from those spirits. And his servant said, there is a witch at Endor. Look at this now, folks. Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes and taking two men with him. He went under the cover of night to the woman and said, I want you to consult a ghost for me. Call up the person I named. The woman said, just hold on now. You know what Saul did? Here it comes. Remember these words, swept to sweep the house clean, Luke chapter 11? He said, Saul, he said, swept the country clean of the mediums. Why are you trying to trap me and get me killed? Folks, look what Saul says. Saul says, as, as God lives, you won't get in any trouble for this. The woman said, so who do you want me to bring up? And he said, Samuel, bring me Samuel. Saul is calling for things that he got rid of years earlier. He removed the witches from the land, and in his darkest moment, when God was silent, instead of going back to the God who called him, he goes to witchcraft, seances, and talking to the dead. That the practices, listen, the practices he removed from the land, verse 9, is all of, in verse 9 and, and in verse 3, he is now beginning to bring back in. Now the witch is back in Jerusalem. Never, never left, but, but it's always the fight to get it back in. And I want to walk you through two things that God began to put on my heart today. Because I want to end, I know, I want to end like Billy Sunday did, gumming sin to death 
instead of like Saul. Anybody with me on that? To say, let's end this fight. Let's end the fight. And let's make sure we're fighting the right fights. So let me give you just two quick thoughts. Jot this down. Number one is this. A battle won does not mean an enemy is gone. Let me say that again. A battle won doesn't mean an enemy is gone. David Wilkerson, the founder of this church, was the one that began to challenge me to read the book and gave it to me called The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. It's a, it is the Puritan's writing on Ephesians chapter 6. And William Grinnell writes about the battle, and this is what he says. He says, when Satan seems to have conceded defeat, do not assume that the battle is over. His flight should strengthen your faith, but not weaken your guards. Don't miss that. Our faith should be strengthened, but our guard needs to be up. See, victory doesn't stop the continual onslaught. Saul and Israel, don't miss this, defeated the Philistines over and over again, but the Philistines kept coming back over and over again. Saul started the battle against the Philistines, continued the battle against the Philistines, and here they are again. They're always back. It seems that every battle Saul fights that he defeats is always with this Philistine. I mean, think about it for just a moment. Jesus faced this. Look at these revealing words after Jesus' three temptations. Here it is what it says. When Jesus finishes the three temptations, it says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him, Jesus, until an opportune time. That's what the Bible says. He left him, look at that phrase, until an opportune time. Ready for this, church? That means he's coming back. That means he's going to look for another way, whether it was going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, whether it was going to be through a Judas, whether it was going to be through betrayal, he was looking for a way to come back. He left him until an opportune time because that Philistine keeps coming and coming and coming. One of the things that Cindy and I love about New York City that we have never had this opportunity to have before is we don't own a car. It's wonderful to not have to deal with the drivers all around us in New York City. It's phenomenal. I remember driving um, when we were in Detroit. I remember I was preaching here on a Sunday night, and I would preach at 10 o'clock in Detroit, hop in a car, drive to Detroit Airport, and then land here about 3.30, and then come here and preach at 6 p.m. at night. And I remember we, the service ran a little bit further than it should have, and I hopped in a car, and I knew I needed to rush to the airport. And as soon as I got out on the main road, some Philistine car <laughs> pulled right in front of me, driving. I mean, can you imagine the speed limit? And all of a sudden, slowed me down from getting to the real battle that was there. And all of a sudden, as soon as that happened, folks, my hand went up like this until I realized it was one of the seniors in our church. And I went like, I went. Cindy was with me. And I wouldn't even look at her. But I felt her eyes boring through my head. Just going, I told you, keep your 10 and 2. Keep your hands on the steering wheel every single time. And, and these hands, which were supposed to be lifted in worship, was now being lifted in frustration so people would understand that they are stopping my forward progress in what they're doing. And all of a sudden, that I had the ability to turn it into a pastoral fake wave is even more disturbing at that point. Because what was happening is that the hand for worship was, this hand is made for worship, not for relaying my dissatisfaction for drivers. And what's amazing is God keeps 
sending Philistine drivers in front of me. You can ask my wife to make sure the hands are reserved for the right thing. Because if I don't, listen, because if I don't begin to realize that that stuff is trying to get into me, I watched it when we were raising our kids. I remember my son in a car seat and I lifted my hands and I remember a car pulled in front of us and this one-year-old went, hey, hey, what do you do? I'm going, where did he get that from? Not the devil. Because it's always a Philistine. God goes, I'll keep sending it that way. That's why if you notice a common battle you keep facing, God is trying to mature something in your life. He's trying to do. That's why Saul kept getting Philistines. And every time the Philistines would read the stories of Saul, fear begins to hit him. Fear always comes in to Saul. The same thing happens at the very end of his life. Fear seems to come in. And that's why, number two, let me give you this final thing. Fear is a catalyst to my old past. Don't miss this. Fear is a scary thing. It is a catalyst to my old past. The great Baptist preacher from Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, Tennessee, Adrian Rogers, says this. Give Satan an inch and he'll be a ruler. Some of you are going to get it. And I think fear is that catalyst for Satan to come in and rule. See, Saul was afraid when he saw those Philistines. So he went back to an old place. I believe an old person and an old address. Look at me for just for a moment. This is too big of a leap to just show up at a witch's house. It's too big of a leap for me. How do you know the address? How do you figure? How do you know where this is going on. I truly believe in Saul's past. He found a place at a witch's table that he has been there before. I believe the occult, this is my opinion, was part of his life, and this was not something new. This was just, this is too big of a leap for this to happen. Why would you end up at the occult? You know what I think it is? I think the occult, whether it was tarot cards, a seance, whatever that means for Saul, whatever that passage means, I truly believe Saul's been there before. And it's always been trying to come back in. It's always been knocking on his door. See, fear is a bondage that wants relief fast and will do anything to relieve itself of it. It will go into any place to get it, especially when you're going through a difficult time in your life. Fear is always the part that wants to bring you back to that old address, that old website, that old relationship, because you do anything to relieve yourself of fear, especially in difficult times. When Cindy and I lived in Queens, I remember going through a difficult time. I got off the subway and I was walking back going, God, you got to get me through this. God, you got to deliver me from this. And I was walking through and the bagel and coffee shop that we used to go to had a ladder that they were fixing the sign in front, and the ladder was there. I watched about six people. I watched them. They were going, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. You don't walk under ladders because it's bad luck. And I'm sitting there looking at that going like, seriously. I said, this is what fear of the future wants to do. It wants me to try to put in everything in place. Instead of trusting God, we're going to trust luck. We're going to trust everything else. And I just said, God, I trust you. I walked underneath that ladder. And I just said, God, it doesn't matter because if luck exists, then God doesn't. But I believe in God. I believe God is able to do this because it's not luck. Folks, let me just say this to you today because I want some of you to hear this because I think it's important. Because it may sound silly, but for some difficulty can easily make you go back to that old sinful place. Saul needed a word from the Lord. What word? Every time they were in a battle, God would give direction. God would speak to them of what to do. But now it's all gone. Saul's sin has silenced the voice of God. So now he has to go to an old place, witchcraft, to find help. And for some of you, it may not be ladders. But I'm telling you, I want you to listen to me. For some of you are sitting here, and I've seen it with believers. Some of you think that because you're a Gemini, a Sagittarius, or a Capricorn, that that's not going to help your tomorrow. Let me help you. You're sitting there waiting in a coffee shop, and there they're posting, I'm Cancer, I'm, I'm, I'm the Bull, I'm Taurus. 
And it, oh, it says that tomorrow is going to be a good day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm a Taurus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let me get okay, ready for this. Isaiah 47, 13. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moon, stand up and save you for what will come upon you. And this is what God says. Behold, they have become like stubble. Fire burns them. They can't even deliver themselves. How are they going to deliver you? You have a choice when the future comes. Do you trust the lady who pretends she could read your future from the stars? Or do you trust in the one who made the stars and the planets and can set you free and walk you through this today. That's what, and, and folks, I've watched people begin to do this, that your tomorrow is in God's hands, not the month you were born. It doesn't matter what month you were born. It's the, the issue is, have you been born again? That's what changes everything. See, Saul wanted to know the future, so he invited a witch back. Saul wanted to know what's going to happen tomorrow because he, he chose not to go back to God. I've watched people abandon God for fear. Fear, the catalyst. We have a, an economy that everybody's saying is now, is now beginning to trend downward. We have an economy faltering. So we have people that no longer will trust God with tithing, no longer trust God with giving. So they build their stockpile. We got people, we have young ladies here that are getting nervous because they're getting older and can't have kids and they don't have a man and fear hits them. So now they start settling for anyone instead of godly people. Well, if I can bring them to church, then they'll get saved. They like sunsets and rainbows and ponies. So this must be the Lord because I like that. Let me just tell you something. When I, this is what Corey Tim Boone said. She said, when I try, I fail. But when I trust, he succeeds. That's what it's all about. So all of a sudden, when an economy goes in, folks, I'm telling you, when economy seems to be fluttering downward, I'm telling you, I trust God more because when I try, I fail. But when I trust, God succeeds in everything that we're going to do. God is the one that's able to do this. This is what Saul does. Saul fears and the catalyst brings him. See, when you walk in fear, get this, when you walk in fear, you are saying, God is not with me. Listen, that's why Saul was afraid. God wasn't with him. When you, acknowledging God's presence is the reason not to fear. In that same prophet Isaiah, Isaiah says this, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I will uphold you my, by my righteous hand. Hallelujah. That's what happens. Because fear makes you go backwards. Fear makes you find an old address, an old number, text something. And instead of falling on our knees going, God, I need you, we start looking for the wrong thing. That's what Saul does. I, I watched it. I, folks, for all those years in Detroit, we, we lived, worked, pastored in some of the most difficult areas. And, I, and this one story, the one moment, I'm telling you, I, I can go back to over and over again where fear struck me in that city when we first started in the ministry. It was on Detroit's east side. It was a rough place. We started what many... Uh, Older folks in the church would remember we started something called a coffee house. Anybody remember that terminology, a coffee house? We started a coffee house, which served coffee, but it was a place that we would feed people, share the gospel, and we called it Straight Street Coffee House. Straight Street. We took it from Acts 9. That's where Paul um, began to start his journey with God. When God struck him with light, blinded him, and, and, and began to bring his conversion, he says, now I want you to go to a street called Straight. It was myself, and this was the craziest thing, myself and a Teen Challenge graduate were the ones that started this coffee house. I'll never forget. His name was Rick. Rick Gulledge is with Jesus today. Rick was, on a good day, Rick was five foot four. On a good day. Depends what shoes he wore. Rick was five foot four, an ex jockey, rode horses, and a heroin user. Five four jockey was addicted to heroin. 
and God marvelously saved Rick. It was, it was an incredible conversion. So five foot four, five foot four Rick was going to help me start this coffee house. We were preaching. It was a tough area. And the first Saturday, this is one of the first moments I faced fear with what we we're doing, thinking, what am I doing here? What am I doing? And right in the middle of preaching, the door slams open. There's 30 people for the very first time. And this six foot four man walks in. His name is Schmitty. And Schmitty goes, what's going on here? He says, I've been in jail for manslaughter. I just got out. And what are you people doing here? This place needs to go. I was about to shut it down. I was about to go like, you're right. And I was about to turn the key and go. I'm telling you, folks, I was, it was one of the first times I felt fear hit me as this six foot four man walked in. And Rick, all five foot four of him, walked up to Schmitty. And he goes, Hey! He goes, Let me tell you something. This is God's house. This is a church on Saturday night. And he says, And you have to get right with God. And I'm thinking, Rick's going to heaven. Rick's going to be with Jesus. And I have to do this coffee house all by myself. That's why we need to shut it down. And Schmitty gets on his knees and goes, I want to get right with God. I want to get right with God. And all of a sudden, Rick is looking at him now, now kind of at eye level now as he's kneeling and he's pointing like he's thumping the chest. He's going like, you need to get born again and you need God to change you. And you got and, and I was in the corner. Now all of a sudden, because he's bold, I'm coming up and going, yeah. Yes. You need to get right with God. Right with God. Come on. I wasn't bold. I'm riding on Rick's coattails. I watched that man get converted. I mean, in an instant. It was amazing. And then he brings me outside. Schmitty brings me outside. And I'm still fearful. And he goes, come over here. I said, yes, sir. He reaches into his pocket. He pulls out a hunting knife. And he goes, I'm a Christian now. He says, the reason why I was in jail is I was the drug enforcer. Whoever didn't pay their debts, I was the one that had to enforce the debts of all the bad drug deals. And he said, and this is what I'd use. I want you to take this. I'm thinking, thank God he saved. Thank God. But here's what's amazing. Do you know, what, know what's incredible to me, church? And it's this. God changed him because someone didn't retreat and I saw an ex heroin jockey stand up to a six foot four drug enforcer for this reason. God was with him. God, at that point, I was going, I was afraid because I wasn't acknowledging God is with us. That's why I'm just telling you, our job is to be a warrior, not a worrier. That's what our job is. It's to say, God, this is what you've called us to do. So let me finish because we've talked about Philistines. We've talked about fear. Can we just close with freedom for just a moment? Let's talk about freedom and let's get us set free here today. Charles Wesley wrote a hymn. I'm going to ask you guys not to play. And then when I play, then you can find, I'm going to let you figure out what key I'm in at that point. I don't trust me with you. <laughs> but I trust you to follow me because I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. There was a third and fifth verse of an old 1750 hymn that whenever I feel fear coming in and I need freedom, when I feel that witch is knocking on the door, those money changes are trying to come back into this temple. I literally, I've been singing it for this entire week and I'll, and I'll tell you in a second why it's the fear has been coming. And I've literally been walking these streets of New York City, and I've been singing the third and fifth verse that goes like this. It says this, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for 
You know that as O for a thousand. Go back to that third verse again. Let me just sing it. Look, 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 look at the words again. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the his blood can make. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood of air. And then all of a sudden, I get really bold. And then I go like this. Jesus, the name that charms our what? Fears. That bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and hell. Come on, sing that fifth verse with me again. Jesus, the name. Come on, sing it, church. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear. Every day, every day, Fear knocks on my door every single day. Every day that knock comes. And every day there is a witch outside of my door promising to remove fear from me. If I would just go back to this thought, go back to this address, go back to this thing, go back to this comforting situation. But I know each day the enemy will come with things to cause fear. He'll cause it with finances. He'll cause it with my health. He'll cause it with my children. He'll cause it with this church. Folks, can I just be honest with you? And that's this. I had fear going into prayer and fasting this week. This is what I, I, these, the, the, the knock at the door, no one is going to pray. What a waste. No one's going to show up. And in fact, not only is no one showing up, no one's getting healed and no one's going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And constantly, the knock keeps coming and I have to keep going over and over. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the vilest clean. His blood avail. And then it knocks again. It knocks again. It's going like, nobody's going to be healed. No miracles are going to happen Monday night. And then all of a sudden, I begin to announce, Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids my sorrow cease. Hallelujah. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and hell. All right, and here's the good news, church. Here's the good news. When I finished my undergrad degree and I still owed money on that, that, that rotten tuition, every email, every letter that came to me, I was obligated to open that letter up because I had to see, what do I owe you now? 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 And so every time I got a letter in the mail from the university, I kept looking at it going like, oh, Jesus, please, please miraculously make it zero. And so I would open that letter up and think to myself, I've got to, I, I was obligated because I was in debt to the university. And I'm telling you what happened. The day I paid off that tuition, let me tell you, they send me letters to this day. As soon as they come, I throw them right out. I said, I have no obligation to you. Send me all the emails you want. I have no obligation. That debt has been paid. So I have no obligation. Say that with me. No obligation. Here it is. Romans 8, 11, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Oh, here it comes, church. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have what? No obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. So when the knock on the door comes, I don't have to open it. Jesus, take care of that. The debt has been paid. My life has been set free. God has set me free today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, listen to me. Let that witch knock on the door. Let that fear knock on the door. 
when the risen Jesus is in you, I have resurrection power in me saying, you don't have to answer, you don't have to open, you don't have to live in fear. The resurrected Jesus is inside of you today. So can I tell you this, tonight people will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Tomorrow night people will be healed from sicknesses and ailments. On Tuesday night, students will be filled with boldness and power to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand with me. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, come on. Lift those hands. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood. Kick it up one more. Can go, up, go up a little higher. Sing it again. Jesus, the name that charms our fears. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now listen, if all you've experienced your life is church and not the resurrection power of Jesus, then you're still under obligation to answer that door. Those sin urges are still there. You don't have the power. And if you're a belief, if you're born again here today, when that witch comes, come back. Let's go back. Old relationship. Bring your standards down. Do this. Stop this. Remember, when I try, I fail. But when I trust, I succeed. And today that can happen. For every Christian that's in this place, I'm telling you the resurrected power of Jesus dwells inside of you today. That's Romans 8, 12, 11, and 12. But if you've never experienced that power of Jesus Christ, I want to invite you today, those that are watching, those that are watching in Kenya and the UK, those in St. Lucia and Martinique, those in the Philippines, South Sudan, those that are watching from all different parts of the world, from all different parts of our country. You know, I want to just say this. It was so funny. In that list of countries that, that, that we're watching, it, it slipped in. It said all these countries, Spain, Portugal, Peru, and then it said Indiana. Somehow Indiana <laughs> slipped in there. Let me just say, if you're from Indiana, trust Jesus today. Trust Jesus today. With every head up and every eye looking around, I want everybody looking. Those online, it's the most important question you can be asked. How do I get that resurrection power? How do I get that inside of me? Because we all know that. Freddie knows it. We all know it. Lenny and Sharif, we know. That witch knocks all the time. All the time. Bring me back. Let me go in. Because fear wants to come. But I'm here to tell you this. The resurrection, resurrected Jesus can live inside of you. And he calls that relationship being born again. Jesus said it. He said, no man can see the kingdom of heaven. I believe that's both eternity and even right here. You cannot experience heaven or go to heaven without being born again. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? It just simply means this. Just as you had a first birth physically and have a birth date, you need a second birth spiritually. And you need a spiritual birth date today. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? How do I? I, I know what my birth date is. Mine is December 22nd, 1963. But you have to go and say, what is my spiritual birthday? Today could be that day. How does it happen? It's as simple as ABC. It's A, admitting that I'm a sinner. It's admitting that every one of us in this place have a condition called sin, and you can't fix it with a priest, a pastor, a promise, a program. There's not a mosque. There's not a synagogue that can fix you. Only one person can fix you, and that's Jesus himself. And as one pastor said, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a savior. We don't need a second chance. We need a second birth today. How does that happen? That's the B word. Believe. Believe that God sent his son 2,000 years ago to become my sin bearer. To die the death I was supposed to die. 
live the life that I couldn't live and give me a reward that I didn't deserve. Think about this just for a moment. If we could fix ourselves, then why would God have to send his son to die on that cross? If all of a sudden you being good is enough to get you to heaven? Because if I was to ask you today, how do you get to heaven? Well, I don't hurt anybody. I've never, I've never, I, I provide for my family. I'm a good person. Those are great things. I was baptized. I was christened. I was confirmed. All those things are wonderful. That's not what Jesus said. Can we come to this one point? If anybody knows how to get to his own home in heaven, it's Jesus. Look at me, folks, online and those in person. Look at me. He knows how to get to his own home better than you know how to get there. And he says, you must be born again. See, confessing him as Lord. Lord is a strong word because it's saying, God, you didn't come and die on that cross, resurrect from the dead to get me to sit in a church for two hours every Sunday. That's religion. Religion says, come in here. But I'm telling you, Jesus wants a relationship with you. When you confess him as Lord, you know what you're saying? You have veto rights. You're the boss now. It means you're not just in charge, and it means you, you just don't talk to me on Sundays. You can talk to me every single day, and what you say goes, Jesus. I'm inviting you not to a religion. I'm inviting you to a relationship with the one who made the stars. Listen, whatever I am on the horoscope thing, I don't care. I trust the God who made heaven and earth and has set me free today, and today he wants to do it for you. So I'm going to ask you to do something. You've got people here that love you and are going to cheer for you. And those that are watching online, I'm going to ask you to make the greatest decision of your, your life. I'm going to pray a born again prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer that says, I want to start a journey with God. I want to be born again. You can keep your eyes open, your heads up. Listen, because if you can't, if you can't be bold in here, you're not going to be bold outside there. And so if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, balcony and main floor online, I want to be part of that prayer today. I want the resurrected Jesus. That witch, those doors keeps coming. The fear keeps coming. But today, I want Jesus inside. I want the power of God inside of me. And when you pray that prayer, I want to be part of that. With no hesitation, balcony, main floor, and online, if you say, I want to be part of that. If you say, put me in that prayer, hold up your hand right now as high as you can. Keep them up as high as you can. I want to make sure I see every hand. Up. Hold them up high. Don't be ashamed. Let me make sure I can see every hand. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Keep them up. There's eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. Keep them up. Twenty-seven, twenty-eight. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Twenty-nine, thirty. Got you back there. Balcony. Keep them up. Who am I adding to this? And there's thirty-one. Keep them up. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. And if you're watching online, just type the word decided, and we're going to lead you in prayer right now. Come on, let's thank God for those 31 hands that went up here today. Hey, come on, let's pray this together. Let's all say this together. Come on, say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, we like to say this part loud. Here we go. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, come on, let's put our hands together. And